on uh, Facebook and YouTube, and they will the recordings will be available on the Facebook pages and rootstech.org as well as YouTube. We don't have a separate handout link for the presentation. All of the presentation's handouts can be found on the Family Search Research Wiki. And I have just put the link to that page in the chat. Um, it's at familysearch.org on the wiki and it's entitled DNA Day at the Family Search Library. We'll be getting started with our third presentation, getting started with autosomal DNA part one clustering in just a couple of minutes. Welcome to those who have just joined us. Uh, this is DNA Day hosted by the Family Search Library in partnership with Roots Tech. My name is Julia Anderson and I will be moderating today's presentations. For this event, we will be presenting a total of six classes. At the end of the day, rootstech.org will also host two additional presentations from industry experts. We are so glad you could join us. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items. These classes are being live streamed on several platforms, including the Family Search Library's Facebook page, rootstech.org, and YouTube. The recordings for these classes will be available on rootstech.org in the next few days. We have created a page on the Family Search Research Wiki for all of today's class content, including the handouts for the individual classes. The link for that wiki page will be shared throughout the day in the chat. Our presenters will be answering questions at the end of each class as time allows. Please post your questions in the chat or comments section and we will pass them along to the presenter at the end of the presentation. If you need help with a specific DNA research problem, we encourage you to sign up to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our DNA specialists in a free 40-minute virtual consultation. Go to the Family Search Library's website at familysearch.org library and click on research help. You may need to keep checking back as we only have appointments open for the next two weeks. So if those are full, you'll need to just keep checking and see when some more appointments open up. Let me introduce the presenter for our next class, Beth Taylor. Beth is a certified genealogist and works as a United States and Canada research specialist at the Family Search Library. She holds a bachelor's degree in history from Brigham Young University and has worked for Family Search for over 15 years. Her specialties and interests include DNA, Quakers, land records, probate records, organizing, and more. And her presentation today is entitled Getting Started with Autosomal DNA Part 1 Clustering. And so I will turn the time over to Beth. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julia. And welcome, everybody, to this third presentation. This is so much fun to celebrate DNA Day with everyone. So today I want to talk a little bit, or I want to introduce the concept of clustering. Clustering is one of the foundational um, kind of processes that you need to master as you work with your autosomal DNA, especially if you're going to try and solve a research problem that's a few generations back in time, understanding clustering is very, very important. So let's kind of get going with our clustering presentation. 
So just as a reminder, as we discussed earlier today, um, DNA is valuable for two kind of big reasons. First off, DNA is inherited, meaning the DNA that you have comes from your ancestors. And like I mentioned earlier, I always think this is kind of cool that we actually have something inside ourselves that came from our ancestors directly. So those people we're trying to figure out, we already carry part of them with us. Now, the other big reason that DNA is valuable is when we compare it. And clustering involves a lot of comparison where we're going to have you compare your DNA matches, your DNA, your list of DNA matches with the list of DNA matches of other people to create your clusters. So you're going to do a lot with, we're going to talk about this comparison and how important this is as part of clustering. Now, as you get started with your autosomal DNA, I do think there are two key DNA processes, and that's why we've got classes on both processes. One is the clustering, one's determining relationships. So in this class, we're going to focus exclusively on the clustering part, and then in part two, which we'll um, tackle after lunch or after a lunch break for those of us in this time zone, in the <clears throat> mountain time zone, we'll talk about determining relationships. So again, this is our clustering class. So objectives today, we're going to do some basics on clustering, kind of introduce the concept. We'll walk through the clustering process, talk about some clustering resources that can help you as you do build your clusters. We're going to focus a little bit on a process called isolating matches, which is how do you create a cluster for an unknown ancestor? because all of these processes you're gonna notice are for, you need to know the ancestor in order to create the clusters. And then we're kind of gonna introduce an example of how clustering works so that you can see it in action. So some clustering basics. First off, well, what is clustering? And before I kind of uh, um, answer that question, I wanna ask a kind of sub question or a similar question how many matches do you have? Now, remember we talked about a match in the first class today being somebody that you share DNA with. So the you took a DNA test and the company that you tested with said, hey, we noticed that you have matching segments of DNA or um, what we use, we use the term centimorgans, unit of measurement for DNA. You have matching or overlapping sections of your DNA with this other person. So therefore, we're calling you a match, meaning you belong together. Somehow you have a common ancestor. So have you ever looked to see how many matches you have? Well, I thought I would take a look. On an ancestry, I have 72.5 thousand matches. Think about that. 72.5 thousand matches. You, you may have more than me. You may have less than me. Um, I looked in about on average, most people have somewhere in the about 37,000 matches. But think about this. Are you able to actually go through and look at every single one of those 72,000 matches to see if it's going to help with your research problem or your research goal? Probably not. So for me, I have 72,000 on Ancestry, another 13,000 matches on my heritage. There could be some overlap. Some people do test with multiple companies, me included. Family tree DNA, I have 6.3 thousand matches, 23 and me only shows me 1.5 thousand. So start thinking, how many DNA matches do I have? I can't go through them all. However, I can figure out a way to sort my matches so that I can focus on the matches that are going to help me with my specific research problem. And that's what clustering com um, comes down to, it's about sorting or grouping or organizing. So when you cluster, you're grouping your matches or you're organizing your matches. You're kind of saying this group of matches comes from this common ancestor, this group of matches comes from this common ancestor, this group of match goods comes from this common ancestor. So now I have a little bit more control and the ability to focus on my question. So really clustering is about helping you focus down to what you really want out of DNA hopefully, which is to solve a research goal or a research problem. So we do this organizing, this sorting by creating clusters of DNA. Sometimes these are called genetic networks. Um, but a cluster is just a group of DNA matches which appear to relate through the same ancestral line. And you can cluster at multiple levels, and we're going to see this today. 
So I've thought a lot about a, another way to explain clustering, and I oftentimes use the a term you're sorting into your buckets. So if you have all of these thousands and thousands and thousands of DNA matches, at some point, can you start sorting them and pulling some out of your big match list and say, these matches belong to grandpa, these matches belong to grandma, these matches belong to the other grandpa, these matches belong to grandma, and even then breaking those groups further and further down. So clustering is just kind of this process of getting some structure and organization around all of your DNA matches. So the basic concept or idea behind clustering is this. So you have DNA and you get your results and ancestry or my heritage or family tree DNA says, hey, there's this other person, Bob, and Bob took a DNA test and you are a match. You have some overlapping DNA. So the company says, well, you have 308 centimorgans in common. We think that means you're a second cousin to a third cousin. Now, at some point, you're going to have to figure out your relationship to Bob. But in this case, you might say, hey, I know Bob. Bob used to come to the family reunions and pull my hair. He's my second cousin. So I already know my relationship. So you have to start building your clusters with known relatives. Now, we'll talk in the, the second half of this class um, about determining relationships, how you figure that out. We're going to focus that we know who Bob is. We know our relationship with Bob. So I always like to draw out little descendancy charts to kind of establish that relationship. So Bob and me and Bob, we share, like I said, around 300 centimorgans in common, and we have a common ancestral couple named James and Sarah, Bob coming through their son, George, I'm coming through their son, Steve. And so we know that we're second cousins. And so I'm going to create, I can now use Bob and look at Bob's shared matches or in common with matches to create my cluster because anybody who shares DNA with me and who shares DNA with Bob, we're assuming also relate to James and Sarah. So I can start building a cluster off of Bob's matches. And I usually name the cluster um, after Steve. So again, this concept is you have a, you've got a big group of matches and Bob has a big group of matches. And what we're trying to do is figure out which matches overlap, which matches are on my match list and which matches are on Bob's match list. And now we're making a guess, an assumption that this group of matches are related through the common ancestor that we're related through. Now there could be a few false positives in here. That's okay. You kind of ignore them as you go, but that's the basic idea behind clustering. So I say, okay, these matches share DNA with me, they share DNA with Bob, they must be related to James and Sarah. So either they're a descendant of James and Sarah, or they're a descendant of one of James's ancestors, or a descendant of one of Sarah's ancestors. So they're related somewhere in that ancestral line. And so I'm going to go ahead, I usually name the cluster after the child of James and Sarah, so they're not as long names. Because all of those DNA matches, if they're related to James or Sarah, they have to be related through Steve, my grandfather. So I actually assign a color, if I'm using the color coding process, to Steve. And then all of the matches that I share with Bob get that color. And now I know that those matches belong on that line. So I essentially sort them. And we're going to walk through this whole process using Ancestry in just a minute. Now, once you've done your clustering, I, I, again, I, I'm trying to understand clustering sometimes takes a little bit of time. So there is another way I like to think of clustering in addition to sorting into buckets. I kind of think about it like a new friend request on social media. Um, I'm a big Facebook user, or maybe you're on Instagram or um, somewhere else. When you get a friend request, but you don't recognize the name, how do you figure out where that friend fits? Well, you go look at their clusters, you go look at your mutual friends or friends in common, however the platform represents that. And oftentimes I can look at that and say, okay, all of the matches or all of the friends I share in common with that person are my high school friends. So this must be a person from high school, or these are my college friends, or this is from this time period in my life. And that we're doing the exact same thing with DNA matches. If you can build your clusters when you get a new DNA match, you look at their clusters and you can and you can share or you can check their shared matches and determine what cluster they belong in. 
kind of the same thing you do as you look at your social media. Now we're just looking at our DNA networks instead. So that's kind of the basic idea behind clustering is this, you know, we're just grouping the DNA matches. So now you're, you're probably thinking, okay, how do I actually do that? Well, each DNA company has a different button for doing this, but they're very similar, the similar processes. So we're gonna walk through the process with Ancestry, but you can apply this to any other company. And in this case, I'm doing Ancestry because they offer the color coding options. So the process, how, what is the process for creating a cluster? It's actually a fairly simple process. It just might, there's a, a lot of steps to, um, a lot of repetition in it. So you start with a known match. You can only cluster if you know for sure how you're related to this person. You can only build a cluster off their shared matches. If it's a guess or you're not sure, then you don't want to cluster from that person just simply because you're not 100% sure that you're going to actually build an accurate cluster. Um, the only exception is when you're doing like an adoptee or unknown clusters. We'll talk about that in a minute. So when you're doing, when, you, when you're just doing your basic clustering, choose a known match. You're going to view the shared matches. You're going to create your cluster. And then you're going to add all of those shared matches into that cluster, into that group. And then you repeat. And I say that you cluster every single time you figure out how you're related to it, a, a person is you do shared matches and put everyone on in that group in the right cluster. So let's walk through this process on Ancestry because I find more people have tested on Ancestry. So it's a good place to start. And in addition, like I mentioned, Ancestry provides us the little color coding dots that help this process work. So here are my list of matches on Ancestry. And I wanted to focus first because I want to create a grandparent cluster. So I'm looking for a second cousin to start with. So I have um, early on, a lot of my matches are my father's first cousin. So I'm really looking for a second cousin. So here I'm going to start with this match. And, and ideally you start at the top of your list and work down. But I wanted to show you with, again with a second cousin. So here's match number nine. Match number nine, it says... She and I share 308 centimorgans. Says she's on the paternal side. Ancestry added this wonderful feature where it's splitting your matches into maternal and paternal. Um, she does have a link tree. And luckily I also recognize her name as a, a cousin. And so I know my relationship to this second cousin. So these, here's my great grandparents. So this is my father's mother my father's mother's sister's son's daughter. You know, let's see how complicated you can think that through, but that means she's a second cousin to me. So now I'm going to build a cluster. And now I mentioned instead of listing the cluster under my great grandparents, I'll list it under my grandmother. I'm gonna create a cluster for her because she shares DNA with both great grandparents. And so we can name the cluster after her but it's really the cluster for the great grandparents. Now, if she were a half sibling, then not, or there was a half relationship, you could do it under the great grandparents' names. So like I said, she's my second cousin, the common ancestor, the MRCA most recent common ancestor are the great grandparents. So the cluster is around my grandmother. So I go and I look at the match page for match number nine. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to find this little button here that says add to group. So I'm going to, Ancestry calls these groups. I'm going to create a group. So I'm going to click add to group. It's going to let me, it's going to show me my existing groups. In this case, I don't have any groups. So I go ahead and click create custom group. And it lets me name the custom group. I'm just going to call this. So it, when I actually name them, I name them the name of the person. But for this example, we're just going to say paternal grandmother. And then I'm going to assign her a color. And you can do what you want with the colors, which is fun. There are 24 colors um, on Ancestry. So I added that color. Um, I, then I'm going to have to go back and add match number nine into that group. So, and then I probably want to add a note that I figured out my relationship. You also, you're, you're going to always want to track that you know the relationship. So you don't want to have to figure it out more than once. So from there, I want to click shared matches. 
So like I mentioned earlier, shared matches, these are the people that share DNA with me and the people that share DNA with match number nine, meaning the matches that appear on my list that also appear on her list of matches. So it's that, that kind of overlapping section. And I'm going to mark all of these people with that pink dot because I'm assigning them all to that cluster. Now, there are situations where those people may not actually relate. They, they could just relate to each of us in a different way. That's okay. Sometimes that happens and you'll end up ignoring them. But we're just going to go ahead and assign everybody on that shared match list to this cluster. So all I need to do, so here's my list of shared matches with match number nine. You'll notice I've got match 13, 14, 20, 21, 23, and so forth. Over on the right, Ancestry has a fun little plus button. And I just click on that. And then over on the left side, it's gonna let me check the box next to every single person's name on the list. I go all the way down to the bottom um, and, and check the box for every single person on the list. So it takes a minute, though there are some fun new Chrome extensions called um, that, that let you check all the boxes at the same time. So once I've checked all of those boxes, and I tend to be the person who scrolls to the bottom first and works my way up, I'm going to, up here you'll notice it says add 177 DNA matches to, and it's listing my available groups, and then I go ahead and check the box for the paternal grandmother. We're giving everybody on this list a pink dot. And then I go ahead and click add to group. Now, one thing to note is that when you do this, Ancestry actually only displays shared matches with that have at least 20 centimorgans or more in common. So it won't, it's harder to add people to clusters below that threshold. So once I have, you know, clicked add to group, it goes back to the same list with the shared matches. 13, 14, 21, 20, 21, 23, and you'll notice they now all have the pink dot indicating they're in the cluster for that paternal grandmother. But notice that some of the people don't have trees or they have unlinked trees or their trees are filled with people named private, 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 and private. Um, it doesn't matter because by clustering, I put them in the, the right group. And now it's possible that I have a research question that's on my paternal grandmother's side, in which case I'm gonna pursue those people and research more and figure out where they fit. Or it's also possible I'm not interested in my paternal grandmother's side right now, I'm interested in my maternal grandfather, in which case th these groups, these people who don't have trees, I can set them aside and not worry about them for right now because they're not in my, the they're not on the line that's gonna help with my current research project. Okay, so I've added them to the group. They're showing up with the pink color. Now going back, kind of reviewing the clustering process, you choose a known match, you view your shared matches, you create a cluster, you add shared matches to the cluster, and then you repeat. So come back to my main list of matches. So you're noticing we're still looking at matches 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's my main list, not the shared match list, but the main list. There's match number nine. Notice I, I put a little note in there that says who the common ancestor is. Um, and I actually will put names in there usually, but in this case, we just put dad's grandmother's parents. So I now need to repeat. I need to pick another match and do this again. So in this case, I pick match number 10. Match number 10 has a nice link tree of 465 people. Pull up the, the 10 now. It does say that it's it's kind of interesting. It said the maternal versus paternal. It said it's unassigned. I'm not sure why. Um, but because they have a nice tree, it's pretty easy. I figured out. We won't look at that tree right now, but I figured out they're actually a first cousin two times removed. It's my grandparents' generation. So that's it's a good relationship. Turns out the, that they're related on my second great grandparents and it's my maternal grandfather is the cluster is. So I'm gonna name it after my maternal grandfather. So I go ahead and I click add. So I have a known relationship. Remember you have to pick a known relationship. I click add to group and I'm create another custom group. This one you'll notice is blue. I'll go ahead and add in a note like I did before. And then I click shared matches. And I'm gonna follow that exact same process where I 
click the little plus and add them all to that same group. Once I've done that, I come back, this is my main match list again. So now you'll notice that we've got various people in different groups. And so I can start to say, there's match number eight, who is not, who, who has a public link tree. I don't know how I'm related. And yet they're in the blue cluster, which means they're somehow related on my maternal grandfather, or it might be down the road, I'll find out they're on my maternal grandmother's side too, but that's okay. But it, it at least gives me a sense of which line they belong to. I essentially put match number eight into a bucket without actually having to look at the match. So that's the big thing with clustering is it lets you focus on the matches that actually relate to your current research goal, as opposed to being overwhelmed with your 70,000 plus matches. You can actually say, okay, these are ones important. These are ones I'm setting aside right now because they're not related to my current research project. Okay, so that's just an overview of how you do the clustering, but it's that same concept. Clustering is all about looking for people who share DNA with you. They share DNA with somebody else that you know, and then you, you can guess what ancestral line they belong to. So let's take a look at some clustering resources that can help. First off, we have the color coding. And color coding is now offered by both Ancestry and MyHeritage. They offer a number of different colors that you can assign to your group. So you can actually just create your clusters on the website itself. When we first started doing this, most clustering had to be done on, with spreadsheets. You had to you know, figure out the shared matches and then um, do some other processes. Uh, adding the color coding directly to the website has been extremely nice in order to create these clusters and, and make this work. And, it, and the, the resources have gotten better and the, the, the number of clicks to add somebody to a cluster has way decreased. Make, um, one thing I would recommend, however, you've got this great color palette, is maybe take a step back and plan how you're going to use it. If you just start assigning clusters randomly, it's possible, or colors randomly, it's possible down the road, you'll kind of feel like, oh, wait, I don't have enough colors. I don't really know what I'm doing. There's no plan. So I would suggest that you kind of think through this. How are you going to use your colors? Um, and make sure that you're adding colors to all of your ancestors, unless for some reason, you have no interest on your father's side and you know that's well researched and well documented and you're not really curious about it you could just do a one paternal cluster and then use all the colors from your mother's side but you want to make sure that you're you're thoughtful in, in your approach to this um keep in mind that if the company also offers the ability to add stars to your matches that the star is essentially another cluster so you can use it in the same way so Kind of here's an example of actually planning out your clustering system. So in this case, um, I've decided to assign this pink to my uh, father. And I, I like to, I flipped things and made pink and the warmer colors my father's side and blue and the cooler colors my mother's side. You get to decide how you want to approach this. And then I've assigned, you know, different colors within that scheme to each generation. And then when, as I solve things, each match will get multiple colors, depending on how many generations back they belong. And that's going to help me interpret the, the, the combination of clusters will help me determine how this each individual person is connected to me. So if I follow this through and I end up with a, a person who has this set of colors on my, um, in my match list, I can actually figure out exactly where they belong in the family based on the combination of colors. Because if you'll notice here on the side with my list of groups, um, that, that I can tell they belong in my father's cluster, in my paternal grandfather and my paternal grandmother's cluster. So they're related on both sides of my father's family, unless my father's parents happen to be related or have double cousins. That's, that's telling me something and they belong to all of the great grandparents clusters. So what that suggests is that this person, regardless of their son of Morgans, is shared son of Morgans is in the first cousin range, but it could be like first cousin twice removed or three times removed, which would drop the son of Morgan numbers quite, you know, a little bit lower because they're removed. But I do know that they're 
somehow a descendant of one of my first, they're either a first cousin or a descendant of a first cousin because of the clusters they belong to. So kind of saying, um, and then in this case, I use the way I use the starred matches is if I know the relationship to somebody, if I'm sure of it, I'll add a star just to kind of help me out. So same kind of thing, if I had this set of colors, um, then they're related to my father's side, to my paternal grandmother's side, to my paternal great-grandfather's side. Um, that's going to tell me something as well in terms of probably which generation or which line they're descended from. So the combination of clusters is also telling me something. So think that you don't have to just give each person one color. You can give them as many colors as you need to help you sort out your matches. Now clustering, there are a couple tools that will let you auto cluster. Um, My Heritage has an auto cluster tool that just kind of creates the clusters for you. It looks something like this. Um, My Heritage has this option, which is actually built off of a, um, something created by Genetic Affairs. GEDmatch um, does auto clustering as does DNA GEDcom. However, note that oftentimes auto clustering is either a subscription or a tier one service, meaning you probably, you might need to end up paying for it in some format. You can also cluster using something called the leads method. The leads method, there's a, a, a part of the handout that talks a little bit more about the leads method, but it's a process of just um, sorting into grandparent clusters. So you can learn more there. And I, I just did this with a spreadsheet. The leads method relies on spreadsheets. Um, speaking of which, you may end up having to just cluster with spreadsheets. It's possible that the company you're working with doesn't have, you know, any kind of a, an automatic clustering feature or the ability to add color coding, then just build a spreadsheet where you do the shared matches and start listing them um, and the amount of shared DNA. Yeah, shared matches relatives. Spreadsheet is you can also you may end up having to track matches. Or on ancestry, that's helpful. Um, so you may end up having to kind of build spreadsheets. Luckily, you'll find other users will have taken multiple DNA tests or tested at multiple companies. So some of us um, are a little bit more. Uh, enthusiastic about DNA and test in a lot of places but you see you can spot the usernames and say okay this person here is this person over here and then you can build a cluster that incorporates more than one company and more than one test. So a cu couple tools that can help you with your clustering. Uh, next up let's just talk briefly about isolating matches because when I talk about clustering the, one of the first things I oftentimes get is how can I actually cluster or find matches for that ancestor? They're unknown. You know, my grandmother, uh, we don't know who her father was. You know, she was, she was born before a uh, great grandmother married, you know, the person that raised my grandmother. So how do I find out who the actual biological father is? And I can't cluster to that, that match because it's an unknown. That whole area is unknown. And that's where um, you can isolate matches by removing clusters. So what you do is you identify known clusters and then you're going to remove the known clusters, the sets of matches that are known and look at whoever's left. So whoever's left behind is gonna be part of the unknown cluster. So kind of for an example, if you this was your tree and you were looking for your biological father, but you know that mom is Natalie and you've got that whole line built out, what you can do is you can build a cluster around mom. And ideally the easiest way to do this is to test mom if she's still alive. So you build a cluster around mom and then you remove it from your, your main list of matches so you can see who's ever is left. So whoever's left in your list of matches are the, the matches, they're your unknown cluster. Um, so that's, that's a way that you can isolate down to just the matches that are gonna relate to this specific research problem. You can do the same thing if, you're, if you have a question mark further back in your tree. Let's say you are trying to research 
Clara's parents. You don't know who her parents are and you're hoping that DNA can help. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to start clustering and removing um, matches from the other lines. So first thing we do is in this case, we're going to cluster down to Clara's child, Virginia. So we create a cluster for Natalie and then we want to split it and create a cluster for Scott, who's the grandfather, and then create that cluster for Virginia, great grandmother. And then at this point, because we have a list of matches related on Virginia's line, we actually create a cluster for Virginia's father, who is known. And then what we do is remove Jacob's matches. So the people that you know are related on Jacob's side from Virginia's matches. And whoever's left should be Clara's matches. So isolating matches is simply doing your clustering so that you can pick some of them out of the family. Now, if you're in a situation where both parents are unknown, so you can't do that at all, you can still build an unknown cluster with the shared matches. So pick the top match click and do shared matches. And, and you can do an unknown match, you know, if that's what that's all your options are. But it's easier to cluster to the known and remove them than it is to just start with an unknown and build the clusters. But when if you're an adoptee, that's what you have to do is you start with your top match, do your shared matches, build your cluster, and then go from there. So when both parents are unknown, then from you would you would isolate down to Virginia, and then you'd look at her matches, take one, do shared matches until you can start splitting out her parents into two separate clusters. So Keep in mind, even if you don't know the ancestor, again, you can isolate down to that by kicking out other clusters, focusing in. So here, let's take the last few minutes and just kind of walk through a clustering example. So let's say we're helping um, somebody named Emily and Emily is interested in finding her biological father. So she wants to figure out who her dad is. So one thing you want to establish is your known information. We'll talk, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later with the determining relationships. But Emily's known information, with like with any other research project, whatever you're doing in research, you have to pick your goal and figure out what you already know. So Emily was born about 1971 in Arizona. Her mother died in 2003. And during her lifetime, her mother, Kathy, gave three different names for her dad. Um, but we do know that Kathy was living in California about the time that Emily was conceived. Um, and Kathy was born in 1947 in Utah. This is actually a fictional example. I made the whole thing up. But just kind of keep in mind, this is similar to a lot of situations that I've, as I've helped people at the library with these kinds of questions. So what we want to do is start by helping Emily by clustering or by isolating her matches. So here's a list of all of Emily's matches. So I went ahead and I put the name of the DNA test taker, the amount of centimorgans, the predicted relationship that was given by the DNA company, and then whether or not they have a tree. So we've got that little link button. So in this case, it's just easy to start from the top. So we look at the first match is Janet. Janet shares 897 centimorgans. And as you get to know the um, something called the shared son of Morgan pool, we'll talk about that more this afternoon. Um, that's about a first cousin match. Emily looks at Janet and says, oh, wait, yes, that is a first cousin match. That's my mother's sister's daughter. So she's a, a known relative. So actually starting with somebody on her mother's side is going to be helpful because we're going to be able to identify Emily's maternal cluster so that we can remove it from the study. So we look at Janet, we know she's a first cousin, she's related to Kathy's parents, we're putting in the maternal cluster. And then what we can do is go look at Janet's shared matches. You might be thinking again, but we don't care about the maternal side, we do insofar as we're gonna take the maternal side out of the, the total. We're subtracting it from the total. So, so Janet's shared matches are Kenneth, Peggy, Dorothy, Nicole, Christina, Daniel, Rebecca, and Elizabeth. So because they share DNA, mat DNA with Janet, we are assuming that they don't belong to Emily's father, but we'll mark them all as maternal, and then we'll take them out of the study completely and focus on who's ever, whoever is left. 
So we're going to go ahead and take those out. You'll notice Henry, who, who was um, about the fourth or fifth one down, is now at the top. So at this point, by removing all those maternal matches out of the study, we're left with people that we think are um, belong or related on Emily's father's side of the family. Because they're on Emily's father's side, so now we've got a good list. But think about this. Emily ha Emily's father had two parents. So Emily has a grandfather and a grandmother. Now, sometimes this works and sometimes it does, but it doesn't. But in this case, we can talk start with her first paternal match, do shared matches and build an unknown cluster like I was mentioning earlier. So we'll start with Henry and all we're gonna do is the shared matches, Henry, Joseph, Heather, Jerry, Melissa, and Kathy, Kathy and Richard, sorry, Kathy, Richard, Matthew, there's a lot of them, all seem to share DNA. All these other people share DNA with Henry. So we're gonna start with kind of a guess that they belong to one of Emily's grandparents. We Now, we don't know which one yet, but we're starting by creating the clusters so that we can then work with that data later on. And then we do the same thing with Ronald and with the remaining matches. We're putting them in just a second cluster. We don't know which one is grandma and which one's grandpa at this point, but that at least helps us kind of split Emily's father's matches into two groups so that we can focus on those two groups separately. So now that we've created the clusters, the next step is to determine relationships. And we're gonna talk about that more in the second half of this class this afternoon or after our uh, break. Okay, so kind of with our conclusion, why are we clustering? Well, it's organizing matches, it's sorting them out, it's helping us focus. So again, when you do genealogy research, you need to start with a research goal. Which line are you working on? What's your purpose? You can't do everything all at once. So clustering is a way to say, okay, these are important matches for this, this current project. These matches are ones I'll worry about when I focus on a different line. So they let you kind of focus on your brick wall ancestor. Uh, keep in mind, clusters are dynamic. They're growing. You don't just cluster once. So every time I figure out a relationship to an ancestor, I go and I do the shared matches and I add everybody into the cluster. And then sometimes I'll go back when I have a few free minutes and I'll recluster on those same people because, you know, you got more matches. So every couple of years, you can continue letting your clusters grow. Um, one thing that's just kind of fun to keep in mind, though, let's say that you have a new match and maybe they're adopted and they're trying to figure out their family and they reach out to you for help. The great thing is if you've already got your clusters built, you can look at the shared matches for them and you might even be able to say, yeah, I think you're a descendant of my second great grandparents because I've built my class clusters and I know exactly where you fit. So keep in mind that you can then help other people because your clusters are complete. Okay, so our objectives today, we went through some clustering basics. What is clustering? We walk through the clustering process, specifically using Ancestry, but it's the same process with all the other DNA companies. We went through some clustering resources that can help you with your clustering. We talked a little bit about how do you isolate matches, especially when you don't know the ancestry you're trying to get at. And then we introduced our little case study or example, which will continue with the second half of this class. Right. So just like we said, we've got two processes, clustering, determining relationships. We'll pick that other one up in the other cl half of the class. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Beth. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, we do have a few questions that have been posted in the chat. Uh, Shelly asked, do you need to look at the shared centimorgans when naming your cluster? So the when you name the cluster, it's more about... The, the paper trail research because you're naming the cluster, either you're naming the cluster after a known ancestor because it's a known match or you're naming the, the cluster um, unknown because you don't know the cluster at all. So the, the number of shared centimorgans is not as important at that point because it's a known match, meaning you should know their, your relationship to them. You might double check that the, the, the centimorgan if, you, if it's a known match, you want to double check that the number of shared, shared son of Morgans fits within that range for that relationship. But other than that, it's, that's not as important to look at. Great. 
Gloria asked why you started clustering around the paternal grandmother in your example, instead of the paternal great grandparents. So it's more about ease of naming your clusters. Um, think in mind, keep in mind that your paternal great grandparents, your, your grandmother shares all of her DNA came from those two people. So naming the cluster after her is just a simplified way instead of having to list both of their names together you're just creating a cluster for her a generation down. So it's 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 somewhat what ease of naming and it's somewhat because if you have a combined cluster with two people in it, it's a little more confusing. So I I it is the paternal great grandparents that are the common ancestor, but we can move down and just call the name it after the grandmother. That makes a lot of sense. Dana asks, do you ever cluster from a match of a match of a match? So so you thinking about like, um, so I'm guessing you mean that this is, it's a match that's not your match. I think I'm a little bit unclear because now if this is a person that matches you at all, then you can create a cluster. But if they don't match you at all, so if they share DNA with one of your matches who shared DNA or they share DNA with a match of one of your matches, that you can't, you can't build a cluster off somebody you don't share DNA with. So DNA only works when you were looking, again, when it's compared with you. So if you're kind of outside that, then you really can't build clusters around that. That makes sense. Um, Judy asks, I have many, many names color coded on Ancestry from the past. Does the clustering wipe these colors out? So um, if, if you're going to start, so the, the problem is that these groups that everybody that you People have been built in groups for a lot of other reasons. So if you are, if you already have an existing set of groups, um, and if you're not using them, I would just start over and delete them all. Um, if you're actively using them, then you might look at your color coding and say, okay, all the warm colors are my clusters and all the cool colors are something else that I'm, you know, so make that plan. But it, it doesn't really wipe them out, but you only have the 24 colors to work with on Ancestry. So just keep that in mind that if you want to build more traditional clusters with the shared feature, like we just walked through, then um, you just want to make sure that you're distinguishing which ones are those types of clusters and which ones are something else. That's a good question. Katrina asked, what about clustering matches when there's endogamy or pedigree collapse? Yeah, so endogamy and pedigree collapse and to kind of um, define endogamy and pedigree collapse for those who don't know. Endogamy is um, a culture or a community um, or a group that's been politically or socially isolated or physically isolated, sorry, it's the term socially or physically isolated for a couple hundred years at least so that they there's so many layers of intermarriage um, that you can have somebody with a really high son of Morgan count who's just related to you in 15 different ways. Um, that's endogamy and pedigree collapses when the same ancestral couple appear on your tree multiple times. Um, in both of those cases, yeah, clustering is a lot more tricky with both endogamy and pedigree collapse. And so uh, you won't get distinct clusters in the same way. And it is harder to use clustering to solve unknown relationships in that case. Um, but there's also a lot of good resources out there in, on endogamy and how to kind of adapt endogamy. I actually think that Tanner did a class on endogamy for roots tech that might still be up and available. Um, so, but yeah, so clusters, it, it does get harder to do clustering with in those kind of situations. Okay. Paula asked, if I recently had chemo and radiation, would that change my test? Um, it, it shouldn't, as far as I know. Tanner, feel free to jump in if you know anything about this one, because I think unless it affects your bone marrow, um, it shouldn't be affecting your DNA at all, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So if somebody else has an answer and wants to jump in, feel free. I have heard that if you get a bone marrow transplant, it does affect your results, but I don't know about chemo. Yeah, unless the um, chemo wiped out your bone marrow, it might affect things. Okay, um, we have time for just one more question. Sauber Bracha asked, is clustering different from triangulation? Um, it, it is to a certain extent. Triangulation is more about, uh, you know, it, it, 
that is so that's a complex question. I haven't actually thought about that, the difference between clustering and triangulation. Triangulation is is more about you know matching segments. It's, there's various definitions for triangulation, honestly, but usually it's about matching people with the same segment on the chromosomes, and there's three of them, so it suggests a common ancestor. Clustering is a more vague grouping. So they're different processes, definitely. So they are, I would say they are def um, different. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Beth. Our time for questions regarding this presentation has expired, but if you need help with a specific DNA research problem, we encourage you to sign up to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our DNA specialists in a free 40-minute virtual consultation. To sign up, go to the Family Search Library's website at familysearch.org library and click on Research Help. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. We will take a break for lunch and then we'll get started again at one o'clock p.m. with our next presentation entitled Getting Started with Autosomal DNA Part 2, Determining Relationships, which will be presented by Beth Taylor. So thanks again and we will see you again at one o'clock.